né? Você vai fazer em inglês ou não? Pode tentar. Quer dizer, bom, a gente vai até o final. Se ficar ruim, é pior para quem tá aqui. É, não, sim. Yes, <risos> yes it is. Eu não tô conseguindo se essa linha aí. Como você vai tomar? Vai ficar vontade, né? Eu posso usar a internet, mas eu não realmente posso. Um dia ainda vai ter a camiseta do Pink Floyd nessa ideia. Hum. <risos> Gmail tá fora do ar. O Gmail. O Gmail, eita, pô. É, na rede tá bloqueando mesmo. Até nas imóveis? Não, nas imóveis não tem como. Nas imóveis ele funciona. Então, mas ele começou a travar. Semana passada ele começou a travar. Que absurdo. Que absurdo. A gente tá transmitindo. A gente não tá ouvindo a gente. Yeah, it's going to be English. Eu já passo de manhã ali e pego uma coxinha igual mãe na cama. O negócio tava tão ruim hoje que é tipo até a moça que tava. Eu molhei a moça que tava sentada com o meu guarda-chu na minha mão. Tá muito Ali na esquina. Na dentro do ônibus. O cara me olhou com um olhar assim, tipo, cara, que você morra. Nossa, que isso, velho. Caramba, eu não tô aí no coração. Ah, tá adaptando. Oh, só um comentário, você já ouviu falar no Pint of Science? Vai ter ah, agora, semana que vem. Então, quem tiver interesse aí, ah, cerveja de ciência, fogo no botão. Pra <risos> <risos> quem gosta, tá aí. Tem vários temas lá. Beleza? Onde que é? Esse, o... São em vários bares diferentes. Mas aqui tem um. Tem, tem um, 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 acho que tem um ou dois bares aqui. Ah. Você tá pronto? Ela encaminha assim, então. Só uma chave que tem que ver essa aqui pra eu ver o próximo detalhe. Ali não mostra? Não, porque é PDF. Só um pouco. Ah, Beaver. Beleza. Are you ready, Hello, all. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to present our. Our presenter today is Ramon, Ramon Santos Vilarino. Uh, Ramon is an undergrad student at the Molecular Sciences Program uh, of the University of Sao Paulo. He studied geometrical aspects of the entropy of black holes. Towards the end of the, his undergrad, he developed, a, he developed an interest in information theory and machine learning, which got him to become a data scientist here at Data Lab. Ramon is currently pursuing a Master of Sciences degree at, uh, a grad, as a graduate student at USP's University Institute of Physics, in which he intends to understand better the whole of geometrical aspects in information theory and machine learning. Uh, Ramon, you can start. Thank you. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, good morning. The paper I brought to present to you today is by this Japanese group and it's called a Unified Framework for Information Integration based on information geometry. Okay. The basic idea that the authors are trying to tackle is the following. We want to make a quantitative assessment of causal influence in complex systems. I mean, we have systems that evolve in time generally 
and they have different parts and they influence one another. You know, the, uh, the past state of assistance influences the, the future state of assistance. We want to be able, you know, ideally, in every branch of sciences, to make assessments of causal influence. Like, uh, I want to know uh, what variables influence which variables going uh, towards, towards the, the evolution of the systems. And the question he wants to tackle is this. How could we achieve a quantitative assessment of causal influence in a consistent and yet general manner? Well, uh, the author's outline solution they draw from consciousness, consciousness studies involving measurements of integration of neural activity. Now, the mathematical concept of integrated information is a measure that defines the integration of causal influence uh, as, uh, I'm sorry, as a degree of uh, the degree of causal influence among elements. You know, uh, so I have a system. They have different parts. I want to know how the information from one part to another is integrated, in a sense. Uh, so, <clears throat> is integrated to, to the evolution of the systems. So, I will attribute to this degree of integration uh, my interpretation of causal influence. Is that right? Um, okay. Just for setting our grounds and what we are really going to be talking about. Uh, consider a, st a stochastic dynamical system in which the past and present states of the system are given by a set X of any variables and Y, uh, the, the respectively, the future of this of the systems for, for with another with other n variables, y one, y two, y n. Well, uh, where n is the number of elements in the systems, then. The spatial temporal influences of the systems are fully characterized by the joint probability distribution, P of X and Y. Let us, uh, let us call P of X and Y a full model. So I have the past state of the systems, okay? Yes. It's characterized by these X variables, the future state of the systems, and I have a probability distribution relating the two things. You know? uh, and that causes all the influence going around. I just know, uh, ideally, in the, in, in, in the present set, this distribution. Okay, I just, I, I want to know the distribution. Uh, the question here is, how do I look at this distribution in the right way so <clears throat> I can understand how information is flowing around the systems? Like, how do I know that uh, for the determination of the let's say, y2 variable, I need information from x1, x3, xn, all of them, I don't know. It could, it could be, well, that, you know, each variable just influences itself, like, if I knew the state of x1, that would determine the states of y1. And no information from the other variables would be important for the, for the evolution of y1, y1 for example. Uh, but I, I don't know that, I just have the probability distribution. So the, the goal here is to look at this probability distribution and be able to determine whether information, information is being integrated or not. Mm -hmm. How like, uh, if my system is such that I have to integrate the, the information first from other variables and then evolve. I cannot just, in a way I wanna know, looking at P of X and Y, if my whole system is more than the sum of its parts. Uh, can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, uh, it seems to me that if you, uh, <clears throat> inst instead of joint probability distribution, you were using the conditional y given x, you were, uh, it was, it will be a Markovian model. We will get there to the conditional probabilities, but the thing is, uh, Theoretically, all the information I have about the systems, including the conditional probabilities, is here in the whole probability distribution. You mean I, I can I can compute with the marginal probabilities and this the, the conditional probabilities. So the whole information, the full information <coughs> is here on my joint probability distribution. And I now and we will get to that. You know, I'm calling this joint probability distribution the full model. 
Like I'm taking into it, it's ideally taking into account everything that is to take into account on my system. Everything is here. It will make a, a, a more sense why I call this the full model in just a minute. Uh, and to your question, I don't know why this is so late. Uh, well, uh, in a dynamic systems characterized by disjointing probability, there are three types of influences. I can have equal time influences, like uh, my system can be such that uh, a given variable x influences another variable x, and this is coded by the marginal probability here, of p of x, okay? And the same goes for the future states with the y's influencing itself, uh, one another. Uh, I can have a cross time influence, and they can be both self influence, like I have xi influencing yi, right? As, as, uh, as a meta case for one part, just influencing the, the same part. And I have cr a cross time cross influences, like xy influencing yj. All of these is conditioned by the marginal probabilities and the conditional probabilities that are, uh, <laughs> that are contained here. Okay? Okay. Consider now approximating the joint probability P of X and Y by another distribution, Q of X and Y, uh, in which the influences we want to evaluate the cause and effects are disconnected, like the, 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 those influences we, we just discussed about. We want to be able to build uh, another probability distribution that is an approximation to P, but disconnecting those influences. We will we, get to how we, how we do this. Uh, well, we'll call Q of X and Y a disconnected model, okay? Uh, then, the important influence can be quantified by how good of an approximation Q of X and Y is for P of X and Y. That's the, the whole setup, okay? That, that, that's the basic idea of, of, of the article. Okay. Uh, well, uh, oh, this got here by accident. <laughs> there are some questions we have to answer before we are able to move on. Uh, first of them, how should the key of X be constructed? Key of X and Y, is it unique? Is it a class of distributions? If it is a class of distributions, how should one choose the right key of X and Y to evaluate it as a proxy for P of X and, X and Y? And finally, how should we evaluate the quality of the, approxim the approximation? So answering those, those three questions, we have a way of determining if the information is being integrated or not. If that's a good way, that's another question. But that's the way we are <laughs> that, that's just uh, It seems that the first of these, uh, the, these items is the one which defines what you were talking about when you say uh, integration or uh, yeah, uh, the connection, the causality is something that you are cutting when you when when you disconnect yes. the model. Yes. So here is where you define causality in this system, uh, right? Uh, until now, we we don't know exactly uh, what uh, is uh, yes for ma formally causality. Yes, uh, the, 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 that is the whole thing, and that's why I said. Uh, if we answer those questions and with that program, okay, we'll have an answer, we'll have a number that makes sense. The question is how good it is. As we will see, the framework has some uh, nice features that depending on how you do this, you end up with different measures. And I'll give you a spoiler, he does that with some already constructed measures, measures we, are, we already know, in principle there are you know, classical for the literature, and this change is what we get at the end. So yes, but, but, but that's, 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 that for me is the most, the, the best part of, of, uh, of the proposal. It's, it's kind of modular, you know, like you know, Docker, because <laughs> you can change those steps. You, you could change the way you evaluate, 
the, the approximation you are making. Uh, you can change uh, how you constructed the, the, the proxy for your, mo for your full model. Um, this one, you might change how you look for it, but I don't have you know, a lot of ready ideas to, to just <laughs> go for this. But, is that all right? Okay. okay. Well, uh, my intent is to answer those three questions till the end of this presentation. But to do this, we we'll can you we'll have to we will have to opt some something on the road. Uh, you have to get to some topics of information theory, like channel information context, channel entropy, and mutual information. This 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 last one more to get a, a grasp of this type of stuff. We need some concepts of differential geometry, that's the geometry parts of the title of the article. And um, you get this notion of a manifold of probabilities. And we will talk about the kubeck leibler divergence as a metric, or sort of a metric, okay? Uh, I, when I prepare these presentations, I try to be as self-contained as possible. So if I am, I don't know, explaining something that everybody knows or, or everybody thinks it's too simple, you can say, <laughs> I just try to, <coughs> Be as you know, self-contained as possible. So I'm going through this contents. If, if it's too slow or, or too fast, or not, just interrupt me, and we can just fast forward for the more interesting stuff. Okay. After we've done that, uh, we get to the paper itself. That's just the background. Uh, we go to to. I'm going to present the framework for the strength of influence, its postulates and the definitions for the measure they are proposing. And we will, we will see how the framework can, can act as a unifier of other, uh, for derivations of other measures, such as mutual information, transfer entropy, and finally, the geometric integrated information that is the measure the, the authors propose. And and if you are lucky, you get to do some comparison, some comparisons between geometric integrated information and this of transfer Okay. Okay. Um, just so we, we, we can uh, enjoy our times. For those of you who got a little bit clear, that's the problem we are trying to solve. We have a past state described by, by these, these variables, and we have a future state in a given system, okay? This, uh, the, the system evolves from X to Y. And all these special temporal influence are coded in PX and Y distribution probability, probability distribution uh, of this setting. And we, we want to understand those influence, and they, <coughs> And the authors wants to know how the system integrates the information from different variables to construct the next state. You know, uh, if I need just to know which variables, how uh, I could just have, for example, uh, a cross time self influence, which each variable x, y influence determines how the other variable y, i is going to be, or you know, stochastically determines. Uh, but I could have a cross time cross influence and equal time influence. These measures, mostly those here, determine how the, the, the system has to integrate information it has to evolve. And that's the problem. Yeah. Okay. Is it possible to have the uh, former two without the latter? It seems that if you have a, 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 a self influence in a, in a, in a variable, yes. and, uh, and that variable influences another variables. Uh, you mean that through if this, yi? If this influence is here, yes, yes, but I have this influence in here, right? Yes, yeah. Then and I would the, have this influence in here, yeah, like x yes. influence in yi. Yes, yes. I know. I agree with you. That's but so um, tricky. No, that's true, but that's that's not a bad thing, I guess, because if if I combine these two influence, if I have this one, so nothing is missing. Okay, okay, okay. If you have things, you know, you know, it's better. How do you say this? 
it's better better safe than sorrow, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Something like this. Uh, OK, so you're going to make a proxy for my probability distribution disconnecting those, those, those connections. And I have to know how to construct this proxy, uh, how to choose it from a class, okay, if, I, if it is a class, and how evaluate the, the difference between the disconnected model and the full model. Uh, okay. Let's go. <laughs> First, uh, I would like to talk about channel information content. Well, the channel information content of an outcome X is defined to be you know, log in base two of the inverse of the probability of that outcome. Uh, uh, I just discovered very recently that some people call this uh, the, uh, the surprise of the event, how much were surprised by that event. And uh, the intuition here is that uh, the more rare this, this event is, the more information you're getting with it. Like, uh, if something is very expected, like, it's very, it has a probably very, a very high probability of happening. If it really happens, you're not learning anything. You kind of already knew that would happen, so you're not getting new information. So the more more rare event is, the higher it is information content. Uh, I like very much an example that makes it uh, that makes this notion very intuitive, at least for me. Let's see if it works here. Uh, we have this this game like when two people two person uh, two people have each one board and they have you know, like ships and you position your ships and I have to <coughs> to guess where your ship is. Okay, this is a simplified version of that game as I don't like you know real world stuff very much. <laughs> where you just have one submarine. So I'm playing that's that's a very boring game. You know, <laughs> I, I have one submarine. You have one submarine, and we are trying to guess where the submarine is. Uh, the submarine just occupies one, one, one of you know, house one, of, one of the squares, and I have 48 of them, no, 64 of them. And we are going to evaluate, to think about the information content of each try you make, how, how much information you get, okay. Let's say you well, well since I let's be uh, since I have sixty four squares, if I make a, a guess and you know, I, I, I try one one <coughs> a given square, I just try a make a guess a random one, uh, and I miss the probability that I will miss in the, my first shot or any shot in the first one especially, especially is very high because you know I have six to three. 63 squares that are not filled and just one that is filled. So I have, let's say I have this probability of, uh, <coughs> of finding that, that ship there. So I go and I miss and it's water and I do nothing. I have, and I have yet, you know, other 63 squares that where the, 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 the ship might be. So I, I, and then the contents of information is, is, is for now, it's nothing, yeah, because <laughs> you don't have nothing to compare with. But it's it's going to be small. This is a small. <laughs> okay. Uh, if I try again, uh, I have a little bit more information, even if I miss, because now the probabilities are, are a little bit better. And I hope. Uh, let's say, uh, in a given, uh, I try an, uh, another square. After I have already failed 31 times. <laughs> At this point, if I make another miss, okay, uh, the chances will be in the, the third second time, I, I, I guess, the chances will be 32 to 33. And if I miss again, I'll have ruled out half of the squares. And that's one bit of information. Okay, that, that's just the, so <coughs> when I when I have finished this step, and I, 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 I how can I say this? I have eliminated half of the of the the board as a possibility. Okay, and I have one bit of information. You can think of this if I'm going to describe, you know, the whole the whole board as a with bits. 
I could, in principle, you know, tell, all right, this is this is half, then take make, take this half and and divide it again, and you would say in which other half it is. So when you have the first half, you have one bit of information. Uh, and I will keep going till when I'm at that stage, I will have gained the total info of two bits. Okay, and that's a really that's a nice number, I think. And let's say in the in my Friday ninth attempt, I just have to I, I happen to hit the submarine. Then I get a lot of information in, in just one time. Because I know the submarine is very hard, right? Okay. This is the, the, the thing we are looking for. If I know where he is, I know the, the I know all of the of the configuration of the space. So this is a rare a rare event that if it happens, even my first try. Okay, this will this will give me <coughs> this will determine the whole setting of the bird. So it's a rare event with a lot of, of information. While whilst <laughs> the other events like the missings, they are not rare at all, and they do not inform me about where the ship is. That's what I want to know. So if, if you hit the submarine in the first try, it gives you more information than in this 49th attempt. Yes, but the total information you gain is to be six bits. And there is a nice calculation of this here. If you really will pay attention to this, what do we have? Let, let's say we, I, I'll, I'll go and I'll just try to hit the summary and in given time. Because uh, logs behave well. <laughs> and I would have this, like 64, 63, to and you know, the sum of logs is like the log of the product. I just put everything here and it just turns. So this doesn't matter how many tries I make. Shannon information content, if I, me if I measure the information I'm getting with Shannon information content, I will always get at the end, when I find a submarine, I will always get the same amount of information. Mm -hmm. That's why it's a good measure. <laughs> at least to me. And I think the whole community. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe someone you, you, you think of a better measure. All right. It doesn't matter if I hit in the I hit the jackpot at the first try or in the last one. All the information I will get is just six bits. Uh, okay. So let's define channel entry. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was a bit, uh, I was a bit, how, how to say this, verbose, <laughs> verbose here, because I wanted, uh, I wanted to, to, at least at this stage, make things as clear as, as possible, because they're they are going to get complicated. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, uh, well, so first, let's define an assemble, and then we define the entropy of an assemble, okay? Uh, this notation is, it's worse for I mean, just I, this. This is me. Like I'm okay. I'm not gonna be that boring. Okay. I just. <laughs> but for me, I would carry this to the end. But I, I won't. Don't do the work. Okay. Uh, and assemble x is a triple of x, ax, and px, where the outcome x is the value of a random variable, which takes one of a set of possible values that are in the set ax. Okay. Having probabilities p1, p2, then pn with a probability of x being equal to ai being equal to pi, pr greater than equal to zero, and you know, it's normalized. I know you, of course, you know this stuff, but just to be clear. Okay, uh, the entropy of an symbol x is defined to be this average channel information content of an outcome. So, uh, uh, so I have uh, this assemble, which, you know, let's say, you know, I don't know nothing about, and I know it's possible that there has an information content, okay? And they have different amounts of information. For example, our submarine, if I just happened at the first try, I have a lot of probabilities going, uh, are changing that. But at the, at the beginning, I have some information, yes, some information. And this average information kind of summarizes how much I don't know of my system. 
Uh, true important facts that are not written here, but are important to get this notion is that uh, this definition is maximum when all the probabilities are equal, are equal, are equal. Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, in this case, I have no criteria from the, from the beginning since I, I know the probabilities. Okay, they, they are my uncertainty. I don't know from the beginning. I don't have any criteria to differentiate one event from another. They are equally probable. I don't know nothing. I, 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 I have learned nothing, so I can favor one event over the other. So I don't know, I know nothing, and, and it's next one. And it's zero when one of the probabilities is one and the other is zero. So in this case, I have certainty. So I can go from total uncertainty to certainty, and the entropy goes all the way with me during that. Day. Yeah, those steps, okay? Okay. Uh, we have uh, quite an analogously, I like this word, but I can't say it really, really, really well. Uh, uh, now I'm talking about entropies for distributions. You know, I, I abandoned my simple ideas. So that you, they were, they were, it, it was important, so we you know what we're talking about. Uh, <laughs> Well, for uh, the joint entropy of a joint distribution is defined that way. Okay. Um, the conditional entropy of a uh, given symbol X, and maybe the symbol is back here, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> is the entropy of the, the, this is this is like, this is the entropy per, of the probability distribution of X given that I know the value of Y of a given value of Y. Okay. So it's just this. That's the, that's the, the condition of entropy of a given stuff. And we can have a conditional entropy of the whole X setting and, and the whole Y setting. Uh, like uh, <coughs> I take the average of the conditional pro the conditional uh, entropy of X given Y. You know, I, I just compute this for all the values of X and weigh these by the probability of every Y. And I have this Condition, that's the definition of conditional entropy between uh, to to a joint symbol. Okay, what's the intuition behind this? Uh, well, uh, let's say uh, if they are independent, maybe you don't gain any information. Yes, I mean, you get to this, uh, but. That's the, the imagine that there is some information of X contained in Y. Okay. okay. So your entropy before you, you you know X. Okay. Here at first you're, uh, before you know anything of Y about Y. Okay. Is some for the you know marginal probability distribution of X. Okay. You just have uh, an entropy for for X. Okay. Now you learn Y. And then your entropy about the axis changes. That, that's the, the that's the thing. This it's gonna be like let's see if uh, let's be see if I uh, I won't say anything that is not correct. I think it's safe to say that this will be <coughs> uh, less or equal to the entropy of x. Okay. In the worst case scenario, Y doesn't tell you anything about X. Yes. And in the best case scenario, Y tell you, tells you everything. If you know how they are connected. Okay. So that's the thing. And we get to this from okay. okay. But the, the, the important thing is this, is how would my uncertainty of X decrease if I knew Y? That's what we were thinking here. Okay. And then finally, uh, the mutual information between X and Y is defined by the difference of this information I get. So I have an uncertainty about X, about the, the whole set of all the possibilities of X I have. Okay. And I learned Y, and I want to see how this information, how this uncertainty decreases. So this is a measure of the information, uh, <clears throat> the information of X contained in the, in the Y set. Uh, important stuff. 
It is symmetrical. Symmetric. It is symmetric, and its size greater than zero. I just said that when I was at that show. I would say something stupid. It's not stupid. Its size greater than zero, and it measures the average prediction in uncertainty. Average, always average. You know, if you really learn why, you you gain more information. But what would happen if I learned why? That's what is contained here, and this is the decreasing in uncertainty. Okay. <coughs> The, the fact that it, it is symmetrical is not not obvious. No, 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 no it's, it's not. It's just when when you write all the, all the all the terms, you know, for this and for this, so you can exchange stuff and so on. <laughs> I think we can take a look at here. Uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe no, no. We need the two terms. <laughs> yeah, but if you, uh, you, we can do it later if you if you will. I, I went back instead of going for it. Uh, okay, is that right? That's for now. All the information theory we kind of need. Are we okay? Uh, okay. So, two differential geometry. Oh, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, So I can go. Okay. Okay. So now, to differential geometry. Well, uh, this ugly drawing, I did it some years ago. You know, I was writing this, this report. I found which was going was going to be very important. I was like, oh, I'm, right, I'm going to write a really, really good report, and someday it's going to turn into lecture notes. And I just, oh, I wrote the, the differential <laughs> geometry for good. And then it got diffused. <laughs> because it was too long. <laughs> but I got some nice drawings and some nice definition. If I ever need to define it, I may pull through somewhere. Uh, OK. Let's define what a main pull is. Uh, to be on, really, really honest with you, because of the difficulties of the, the, the technique they proposed, this is not essential for me to get the idea they are trying to make. But if we're going to learn anything with what they're proposing, this is very important. And I think that's the thing. Because, and I'm going to give you another spoiler, as you see at the end, the measure they are proposing is difficult to use in real life for now. It's from 2016, and they are like, mm, I don't know what to do yet. So I, I think getting to the ideas is, is going to help us more than you know, just get to know what the stuff is. So let's try to define a manifold in, in some, in, we have a good definition to a manifold. OK, to properly define a manifold, or before pro before properly defining, that's what I intend to write here. Uh, we need some other concepts, namely M charts. Okay, given a set M and um, just a set, there's nothing special about the set. It's just a set, N set, uh, and any chart is understood to be the tuple, the two tuple of a subset U of M, like this subset here. This is the this is the, the, the this is the set, this, 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 this column here, <laughs> this is the set, this is you, the subset, and we have a mapping phi, phi, phi I guess, phi, we have a mapping phi from you to the Rn, okay, and with two properties. The first one is phi is one to one, okay, so we have to go back and forth, we have to be able to define them to go back and forth. And the image of U, the, 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 the set U, is an open set on RN. Okay? Uh, this is important for to define a, a topology here on the manifold in the use. Uh, the whole deal with manifolds is uh, they are like um, they are like uh, they are locally look at look at the line, the RN. So we have this stuff. 
we find a way to map it to the RN where we know things and we can do a lot of things, including geometry. And we discover how to make this map and you use them to define stuff, including the topology, your metric, your distance, everything. Okay? Uh, okay, to obtain a manifold from a set N, we have, we must have some other things. We must have enough N charts so that they cover N. And for that, I mean, we have a set of N charts and we must have enough subsets that they contain all of the sets I'm trying to, to define. So I have a set in, and I have enough subsets with enough one-to-one uh, uh, one, 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 one maps so that they need fine. Uh, okay, and consequently, we define maps for, uh, for every region of n to the RN, okay? Mm -hmm. Beyond that, whenever two or more in charts overlap, uh, and in their respective U subsets overlap, you know, like we, this, like here, this is the set end now. <laughs> this is the U, UI, and U, U and U, U prime. Okay. Whenever they have an overlap in, in their definition, yeah, we require them to be compatible. And to be compatible means <coughs> uh, since the two functions are invertible, okay, uh, I can define a map. Okay, let's say the, 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 the prime chart takes this set here to the to one part of the RN, okay? And this other chart takes it to the other. Uh, since they intersect, they both take the intersection to different parts in, in general of the RN, okay? So uh, to really have a manifold, I want that I, I use those, those, those maps here to define a map from one inter from one image to the other image. So how do I do this? Like I got a map from this set to here and use the other five for, to go to here, from here to here. And this define a map from here to here. Do you get it? Or... What is an end chart? Oh uh, any chart, an end chart is this 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 two tuple of oh, you okay. and the map. Okay, and it defines the dimension of a proper manifold. So, I, I didn't understand this mapping between the the squares. Okay, okay. This okay. This is the manifold. Okay. All right. This is the 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 this, this, the, the square in the arch here. Okay. okay. Uh, so I have a map by definition that takes all the elements in U to the image of, of phi and all the, the the elements of u prime to the image of phi prime, all right? Uh, since they intersect here, they both take the intersection <laughs> to different parts of the RN. Okay, phi prime takes this part, this this this, this dashed part to here, and the other takes this dashed part to to another place. Whatever they 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 could coincide, but they. But I, I, that's that's not a, what yeah, that's not what I am required. What I require is okay, since they both map the intersection to different places, okay, uh, I can go. I can use this property to define a map from one image to another to the other image. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, Let's take a point here in, in, in the RTDN, okay? In the RN. Uh, I use the inverse of phi prime to go back to my manifold. It takes up the a point here to a point here, to an element here of my set. And then I can use phi to take these elements to the image of phi. So I went from the image of phi prime to the image of phi. I can only do this at the intersection, but I, that, at least there I can do it. So whenever this happens, and the requirement I make is that this map define it from here to here by this operation, all right? Like first go up, then go down, or first go up and then go down, okay? That this map be infinitely differentiable, all right? And, and this notion is defined because these two form a map from Rn to Rn, and I know how things differentiate in the Rn. 
if you required the, uh, the intersection? Inter intersection to be the same, it will, it will be the same uh, yes. as, as choosing a, a single mapping from uh, the entire manifold to the... Not for it, because the chart right. is defined by the subset. For example, uh, a famous case is that of this sphere. And you have to, you, you gotta have two maps. And some maps you can define, take the same parts of the sphere, two other parts. But you need to have two of them because you can, you can make it universally. So the U is the, 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 set, the subset U is a part, is an important part of the definition of the chart. So in generally, even if the intersection, you don't have the same in chart because they would have different subsets. But in principle, you could have. And in that case, where they take the intersection to the same values, you would have an identity, an, an, an identity map from here to here, and it is infinitely differentiated. Okay. Um, so, kind of the definition of a manifold. Uh, we define n dimensional C infinite real manifold then, to be a set together with a collection of subsets Y satisfying the following properties. Uh, each point P or each element of the set M is in at least one of the subsets that are going to be mapped because I want uh, your, yeah, the collection UI covers them. That's, that's the same, the same requirement. Uh, any two charts in the collection are compatible with each other. If they do not overlap, they are compatible from, from the start. If they overlap, that's the, the requirement I just mentioned. And any chart which is compatible with all the charts in the collection is itself in the collection. This last, <laughs> this last one is a bit tricky and for practical purposes, it, it's not really important. It's just if you don't put this here, it would be impossible to define a manifold. Because a manifold is not just the set we're talking about, it's the method. Because you need to know how to get there to the RN, because in the RN is where you know how to make stuff. Because manifolds are stranger things. And when you are making this map, you are saying, okay, I know I'm taking two different things, but I have uh, a clear definition of how to take this uh, this here to here to there where I can make my calculations, and if uh, and if I have I have um, I, I, if I have if I have not this last requirement I would have I would have two different manifolds if I found two different ways mm -hmm. of mapping of mapping stuff and I, I don't want this I want to make have a practical definition that works so even if you don't use the, the other end charts, it's in there in the definition. But it's called the maximal atlas. Atlas is a collection of any charts, so it's the maximal atlas requirements, just for consistency. It's like if you have uh, one set of n charts mm -hmm. that covers yes. a, a, the full manifold, and you have another different set that also covers the whole manifold. Uh, the whole the, set the, the, the whole set, set M. M. Okay, yes. the, the manifold yes. is both of them. Yes. It's not one of them. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, if you have it, so if you have a set of any charts that cover your main, <laughs> so if you have a set of any charts that cover your manifold, right? And you have another that also covers. If they are not compatible with each other, you have two different manifolds because you have two different ways of mapping. They are not compatible with each other. But if they are, you don't want them to really be different manifolds. You want them to be the same manifolds. So that's you might you might make these requirements. All right. Uh, okay. So information geometry takes this idea of manifold. It's very general. That's that's what's nice about manifolds. When you take a step back, make this rigorous definition and, 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 and define this way of thinking of things, the definition is very loose in the sense that almost anything can be a manifold. But once you make the, the proper statement and you see this stuff as a manifold, then you can start thinking about it geometrically. 
and we know how to do and think a lot of things geometrically, like baseline and stuff. So information geometry <laughs> deals with a manifold of probability distributions and elucidates its geometry in the manifold. So I have this probability distributions and I find a way to look at them as a set that I can map to the RN and then I take distance, I make internal products, I make a lot of crazy stuff that helps me to understand better my probability distributions. That's all about it. That's, so each point in the manifold, each element in the set, is a probability distribution, and I study the relations between them. Uh, to give an example, not the name of the more, uh, consider a probability distribution, where x is a discrete random variable, think n plus one different values, okay, let's say this, and pi be the probability that x takes the value y. Um, Okay, this. Uh, then I would have a vector. Uh, I, I would. I, I, I'm sorry. In principle, okay, I could have uh, a lot of different distributions that works for this case. It, it's pi being something. Okay. So I have this probability distribution. I have a way of mapping them universally. In this case, it's not always the case, but in this case, I can do this universally of mapping this vector, giving, uh, giving the, the values of the, the PIs, this defines a vector in Rn. So I mapped the probability distribution to a point in Rn, so I can think of them as geometrically there. That's a simple example. I could do this, for example, another example, another simple example, you could think of the less restrict to, to think about manifolds of uh, Gaussian distributions. So you have sigma and you have me, and this define a distribution. And they have to, they can take they can take a variety of, of values. So uh, you you kind of have this this vector of two components that defines another Gaussian distribution. So you could you have this manifold in this way you have this manifold of Gaussian distributions. And this the good stuff is that now you Link those ideas, then you go and make geometry because geometry is better than algebra. For me, at least. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, so let's go back a step to information theory and define the Kubek Liber <sighs> divergence. So, first, let's talk about what are divergences. Right? Uh, well, given two points Q and Q, P and Q, and Q, satisfying the following criteria, we have the D is a map yeah, that, that takes two points P and Q to, to, to the real numbers, uh, and it measures a degree of separation between points P and Q. Uh, the, first, the first requirements you want is that your divergence always be greater than zero, because you want to talk about some sense of separation between stuff. And negative separation doesn't make much sense yet. Uh, you want to have that D of P and Q be zero just when P equals Q, all right? Because it's the same, it's not diverging from each other. And this one I don't really like, but if I didn't put this here, I would take you know, just two hours to talk about this. <laughs> uh, that, that's the disclaimer here. Okay. <laughs> when P and Q, uh, this is, and P and Q are sufficiently close by denoting their coordinates by uh, psi, psi, or psi, psi, psi P, and psi Q is this, but the infinitesimal element in the, this is a coordinate system, okay, uh, defined by the charts. The Taylor expansion of D is written as this is terrible. Like this. <laughs> okay. You have these matrix elements that are really require to be positive definite. So you have this, okay? And these terms you are going to ignore. Okay. This is a how do you say a tiny? Chart grid. 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 
shortcut. These are shortcuts, so you don't have to define metric tensors, and vectors on a manifold, dual vectors on a manifold, and then they then tensor on a manifold, and then a metric tensor. Well, and you just see this. What you're saying is when there are sufficient rows, you have a simple uh, yeah, as when, as when like, the thing is, since, uh, I, I want to have some, yeah. since manifolds, I think of them locally, since you think of them locally, the thing is, um, think about, okay, if you go back to the definition, of our manifolds. I forgot to say something that is intuitive and very nice to say about manifolds. It's like we think of them as this stuff that locally or in, in, a, in a given neighborhood looks like the RN, but globally you don't know. So when you do stuff on manifolds, what you do is do it infinitesimal because you are going to change from charge to charge, you're going to do stuff, crazy stuff. So <laughs> when you do, you, 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 you don't know how to de define a, a unique and general, uh, and general distance. Let's say for, uh, I want to have a better example than what I was right now. You don't have a way of defining a distance between two points in a sphere. When you do this in Euclidean space, what we do is we take the, the straight line between them, okay? Here, we have a, gen a generalization for the notion of straight line, but uh, it, just, it doesn't generalize that well, because I could have a, a straight, a, the, the, this notion of straight line, for example, could go from here, goes all the way around and starts here, and this gives me a distance, okay? And they, they could go here, for example. So I don't have a proper way of defining distance for two arbitrary points. Another thing I can do on spheres, just to, to have this idea why you need manifolds, is I don't have the notion of, uh, of make a sum of the two points. In RN, this is trivial. I just have a point here, I have a point here, I just sum their components, and I have another point defined. Here, I don't have a good way to do this. Mostly because I don't have one, one, one simple map. So what I do on manifolds is to define this quantity, which is a metric tensor, that tells me how in a vicinity, if I, how I measure this distance. So if I want to know my distance from here to here, I have to know the which, which, which track you are taking. Uh, OK, I want to know the distance from this point to that point on, on the globe, for example. Okay, but first you tell me which route you're going to take. And then I integrate this measure here. So I have all the way up. Okay? That's, that's what is, it is to say. And the way of defining this here and this here is, is kind of this generalizing this idea to the manifold. And that's why he does this. He suggests of doing that way in the support material. The support material of this article is, is really, really good. Um, and I have to say, we're reaching our time limit. Okay. okay. So I'm thinking, uh, do, you, do you think it would be better if we make another journal in the next week to keep going uh, in a better, without hurry, with the rest of the material? Or you, do you think it's reaching the end and you're, I because think, I think it's, yes, it's getting in the beginning. Yes, it's, it's gonna get complicated yet. So I, 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 would, I think it, it's a great idea that we discuss this uh, information theory concepts in a more, yeah, we can discuss, we, we can end, end it here mm -hmm. and, and discuss things you, you put thus far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. next Friday, we we make a, yeah. another journal yeah. going to the yeah. full If I, if I say it didn't think it could happen, I would be lying. I, I was like, <laughs> ooh, I have a lot of slides already. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
but, but but as I said at the beginning, the choice was just I could just present the paper and, yeah, that, that, yeah, that, and we wouldn't be meaningless. Understand. But I think if you ever buy okay. it, I just would like to introduce it, the the the, the key of divergence, and that makes us that setting the grounds what what we need to understand to understand the proposal. Yeah, it will be awesome. All right. All right. So, so we can adjust that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so we can adjust and discuss information uh, theory. One more slide. Uh, this is the definition of the Kullback Kleiner divergence. Uh, as everything, probability, if the probability distributions are not discrete, you just make an integral and stuff. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, the Kullback Kleiner divergence, it gives you a way of analyzing the, the difference between two probability distributions. Okay. Um, some call this some some people call this divergence this divergence the relative entropy between two distributions. But to be honest with you, I couldn't yet get a, a quite of a good intuition about this. Okay, because we could you know separate these terms and we, and we can discuss this now. And I, I I look at for some 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 stuff for learning this and nobody. Ever really gave me a good explanation of why this makes sense. The, for all I know, is the best excuse for the divergence, for the chaos divergence, is that it works well in a lot of situations, and you get intuitive results, and it's related to the to the, the channel entropy. Uh, the thing is, if you look here, you have uh, a term that is clearly uh, minus the entropy of Px. Okay, and you have this other term that makes no sense to me because you analyze the, the <laughs> other term would be like p p of x times log in the base two of one over uh, q of x. So you have this and minus the entropy of, of, of the distribution p. So this first term is like you are analyzing the information content in q of x, but Waiting it by the probability of the other distribution. So, and that's that's a difference. So you need to take a different. Okay, so you have the at the uncertainty you have about p of x. Okay, and then you have the average uncertainty you would have about p of x if the content of information of each event of p of x would be determined by q of x. Mm. I can I, I should write this down. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, when you open these terms, you're going to get. Uh, okay. Q Minus D of X log one D of X. Right? So this this is the same. This is this is scale divergence. Yes, yes. Yeah. I just I just yeah. uh, exactly like uh, that. Ah, okay. I just put okay. minus sign here okay. and put the minus yeah. on the yeah. That's right. true. Yes. That's fine. Because this has an intuitive form. This is summit is the entropy of the distribution P of X. And we have a nice a nice uh, intuition of what this entropy means. It's the average concerning that I have given this probability. Okay, so, but I take this other measure with is averaging averaging the information content. In each event described by Q of X, but waving it by P of X. So it means like I wanna mm. in a way you see how would my uncertainty change it if I traded the information content described by this probability by the information content described by this probability. So I have information uh, kind of development here. So I have 
This is information content of each event. Okay, so a probability determines an information content for a possible uh, outcome of, let's say, an experiment. Okay, a probability determines content of information for each possible outcome. All right. Uh, when I look at the entropy as an average uncertainty, maybe maybe maybe, maybe Lucas could help us, right? <laughs> Actually, uh, if I take the average of this uncertainty, I will have I have this entropy. Okay, so the the key of divergence would say how different would it be if I would average instead of the way the the if I would average instead of my MP and probability P. So I have uh, probabilities and I have the content of information I attribute to each event, right? So I, I would like to know what would be my entropy <laughs> if instead of giving my information content attribution to its outcome, I gave Q of X attribution of information content. How would my entropy change in that situation? So this is, I think this is the intuition. This is the better I can think of so far. I can. So with this, all this framework, we will be ready to answer the questions I put in, the, in that slide. And that would, that, that's where the paper would be. Okay. Well, let's think I'm over the first, the first part of the presentation. <laughs> and now we open for uh, more open discussion. And I, I was thinking mm -hmm. like, yeah. about uh, KL divergence because it's so widespread in uh, its usage. Uh, it seems to me that there is some kind of thinking about KL divergence, like in the sense of how much you need to uh, get to a distribution uh, in terms of evidence how much evidence you will get, uh, you need to get to P given Q, you know, in the sense that if Q is, if, if I have zero prior, one of them is a prior, another one is the posterior. If, if one of them is the prior uh, and it's zero, then the, uh, the entropy will get infinite. The, the K, K of divergence. No. Mm, well, no. Let's say if Q of X is zero. Either one. If either one is zero, you get. But I, I don't know if it's defined if we, one of them is zero. That, that's what I'm thinking. Okay. Maybe it's not defined. I think I read something about it. I don't know, because in principle you could, you know, just take it out from here with a sign, but it's a zero. I don't think it, it's, it doesn't seem fair. So maybe it's not fine if one of them is zero. If one of the terms is zero, I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, I could check for it. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. And that's if zero you have no event, and on the other side you have discrete something, and then you should not have um, an infinite uh, amount. Right? It will always be infinite, and also it will never be zero because you don't have the, the event. Mm. But uh, if P is zero, you do. Okay, but but, but we can't. Uh, that, that's the that, that's the hard stuff to me, and that's the because it, it's to me it's harder to think. It of of course it's possible, but it's harder to think about the the prior and posterior here because we are talking about the whole distribution, how the whole distribution changes about your all possible outcomes. So it's it's a bit more more careful because it has different terms. You know? What what. What do you mean when you say one of them to be zero? Is to be zero for a given x or to be zero for all of them? If for you're given x. x to zero for all of them, doesn't. And also, the, the other question that I 
I was in mod, not in the part of uh, Chrome Liner. The you have the three options for interaction. You have the cross time, mm -hmm. cross interchangeable interaction. You have the cross time uh, inter in, interaction by itself, and also you have the equal influence. So this equal time influence, if, if we think about a uh, real a realistic system. Uh, e, that should implicate um, uh, real time, uh, let's say, oh, I get interaction. You know, yeah, that, that would be, uh, 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 implicate. Um, yes. yes, you don't have uh, latency between interactions. That would implicate, yeah. uh, can I say, instantaneous interaction? Mm -hmm. yeah. Instantaneous exchange of information. It's yeah. worse. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I disagree with you. That's an approximation. Yeah. So, so pr probably the real problems that we should tackle at some point, somebody should tackle with this approach. Mm. We won't consider the, the second two case, the across time. Let me think of this. I think it depends because. Um, Because in a way, think of, uh, let's pretend relativity doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> Before it didn't exist, we take for example, right? Uh, we thought back then <laughs> that we have a configuration between Earth and the moon, for example, right? And they are in a given, in a given time, they are in a given position, and they are exerting instantaneously influence, influence each one another with one another, right? So if you take one out, that would change the present state. So if we make, we know that it's not really instantaneous, mm. but this notion still makes sense that the position of the Earth now Depends on the position of, of, of the moon. We know we have this, you know, of the stupid light limit, but uh, that, that comes from a pre previous information. The position, the influence of the position of the moon and Earth, the relative distance between them, for example. I know a good example for you. What about entanglement? Entanglement, yeah. Oh, yes. I, don't <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this is a good example. <laughs> I'm not happy with this. <laughs> but I, entanglement I is have... tricky because it appears to have instantaneous influence from different parts of the system. That Einstein actually proposed entanglement as a he way of. And oh, he proposed to say, oh, this quantum theory you're making, it doesn't make sense. So it, it, it's just, it's missing stuff. So because you have influences between distant stuff from one part to another. The nice thing about this entanglement stuff is that you can't use an entanglement system to transmit information instantaneously. Uh, if the outcome of one measurement of one part of the system determines the, the outcome of the other. But I, I me, Ramon, let's say you have one part and, we, and I have another part. If you make a measurement, that will determine the state of, of my, my part of the system. That's the basis of entanglement. But if you didn't tell me you made a measurement, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have to know that you made a measurement. So I wouldn't know if, I, if my state is just being it or it's being that way because you made a measurement. But the effect on my state is instantaneous. But the information about your state can come to me instantaneously. So information behaves relativistically. <laughs> that, yes. Yes. But you need quantum mechanics to make sense of equal time influence. No, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, I, I don't think so. And, and, and we did this for you know, 300 years. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's yeah, so 300 years out of its scope. Oh, yes. It's more mathematics out of the scope to your, like, yes. like <laughs> when, you, yeah. when you approach something with many data. And no, no, that's, just, that's how you, that's, it's a way of modeling a system you are, you are trying to think about. As I, I joke, but we actually did this in physics for yeah. 300 years. We just, okay, this is instantaneous influence. So, the, so but, yeah. you know, electromagnetic game, it was, oh, there is no really this thing. But yeah. even in that situation, for some practical purposes, you could just, you know, ignore the, the, this delay that is for practical distance is very, very limited. Let's say, because there is another problem in there, because we are I'm going to define an instant of time, an instant, and that's a problem since Aristotle. So when I say the present states, let's say if I'm observing this, like I wait for the relaxation for, for some time, let's say like two, sec two seconds, for example, if it's assumed a form, but in greater periods of time, it evolves in a different way. So I take one short period to look at now, okay, right? And then understand the evolution. That's the way of modeling your problem, I guess. Yeah, I think one thing that's, that's not clear to me, I, I just perceive it now. I don't know if you're going to talk about this next Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, how can you get from the joint distribution to the across time influences? Because you you can have a full model and you uh, okay I, I give a it, it seems to be possible that you make uh, that you reach a joint probability uh, going from state to state that are yes. near each other but, or going to just any other state following the joint pr probability. But I, I didn't completely understand. You, you have a joint probability for it, right? Ah, uh, okay. X is the, I, the past. Yes, X okay, is the past, Y is the X. future. Okay. And next. that's how the okay. X is the past, Y is the future. For one instant, I, I thought you, you were, we're talking dealing about with P of Y's. Mm. But you have. Y and X. The joint. Okay. Across time is. Yes. A way I'm a sense of making about all this stuff is like, uh, for example, <laughs> we have a given, we have a client in there in our CPFO <laughs> problem. So they have some features like the consumption this month, how much he, he makes. Uh, how when how many people live in their house and some variables that will change from one month to another and of course within the same month they influence each other so uh, I mean how what that's how I'm modeling the problem so how much I made this month will tell me how much worried I'll be about you know my energy consumption so but I'm modeling these as same time interactions you know so I could in principle look for the distribution of these values in a month and look for the distribution of values in another month and then build a joint probability distribution and instead with this framework how things are really interacting for this evolution to happen so i would have same time influence that would be within the same month within the same observation for example thinking in practical terms more questions Right. And the, the way that, let's say, how much you increase the, the entropy by that, that um, summary finding is like the guy who increases a lot, you can say, oh, he's, uh, you can call it lucky, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> think that's right. it for now. Let's think how more game. We'll see each other next Friday. Thank <laughs> you.